Hi parents, welcome. I apologize for the delay start for at least that. Now, um, we have uh, some technical problem and um, also one of our guests had to uh, reschedule because of um, a death in the family. So while the other guest is trying to log on, I thought I would just come on and say hello to you guys and use this time for Q&A. So where you guys calling in from, please say hello, let me know where you're calling in from. And while we have time, um, you know, if you have any questions, I know that I rarely get time to answer to your messages. I get a lot of messages and emails and things. So now that we have a few minutes while, you know, um, John is trying to log on, if you have any questions, this is a good time for you to just post it in the comment and I see if I can answer any of those. Hi, Matthew. Thank you uh, for joining us. Hi, Elena. Hi. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, so let me know uh, if you have any questions or anything. Now is a good time. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that we have, um, as you know, we have a documentary film uh, called Parental Alienation, The Aftermath. That film, um, we have a 24 minutes version finished and we in the process of finishing the 110 minute version of that film. Uh, that should be done soon in a few weeks. Um, and then we have another documentary film that's called At All Costs. Now, um, Parental Alienation, the Aftermath is a documentary film where we interview a number of adult children of parental alienation and they share their experiences and how parental alienation have impacted them all of their lives and how um, they continue to live uh, their life suffering from the consequences of of parental alienation. Uh, we thought that was important to have a film that shared the, these stories because parental alienation have always been seen as a dispute between the parents. And people kind of forget that really the ultimate victims of this is actually the children. And why we need to see and recognize that this is child abuse because the impact is lifelong and is permanent and is devastating. So uh, this is the first time that the children are speaking up. And that's why we thought it was important to bring these stories out to life. So that's why we have this documentary film called Parental Alienation, The Aftermath. Now, so, uh, hi, Albert, uh, thank you so much, um, and hi, Stacy. So then, so uh, with At All Costs, it's actually a different documentary film. At All Costs is actually a documentary film about a, a particular case of parental alienation. It's, it's, it's really a very tragic um, case of parental alienation that happened in Colorado. And uh, with this situation, um, it, it's a custody case that went on for five years that that involved all government agencies that you could think of, you know, from um, family court, uh, civil court, um, uh, criminal court, we have the district attorney office, we have the child protective agencies, we have multiple states involved, we have um, yet yeah, really just everybody involved in, in this particular case, and everybody overlook the fact that this is a parental alienation case and the case was so tragic to the point that um and it is involved all type of things you know from um actual domestic violence where that perpetrated by the alienators as well as um you know online stalking um and all sort of things and also false allegation uh, which is something you see a lot in parental alienation especially severe cases um the children even you know like the child was forced to reject the parents so there's custody interference there was step parents involved um the school were involved so this case was a very complex case complex case and even you know the lo local police um and we we even went and interviewed the local uh, police officers and um this case ended very tragically where eventually um the case went to a family court a hearing after five years of back and forth you know custody interference and child protective agencies and everything um and the judge finally saw the light and the judge said well this is a very serious case of parental alienation and i think i'm going to try to fix this somehow and so because the alienator was was exposed um that night the alienator killed the child and so this is a very tragic case of parental alienation, and that's why we called it uh, 
at all costs. That's the name of the films, because really, in this case, the alienator went and did everything possible at all costs in order to destroy the targeted parent. Really, this alienator did not care whether it was a child's life or anything that was at stake. And so um, this is the other documentary film that we have been working on. Um, we travel quite a bit to film that. We um, So we missed one particular important interview. And this person that we supposed to interview is a lawyer of the case, and she has been very busy. So we have had to reschedule this interview multiple times. So uh, right now, we still haven't got that interview. We were supposed to go to Colorado a few weeks ago to pick up this final interview, final day of filming, but she rescheduled again. So we're trying to get that interview in place. And then in the meanwhile, we have decided to go ahead and started post-production for that film. So um, just wanted to let you guys know that. So we have one film that is in the festival circuit now, and the other film is in post-production. And um, so anyway, uh, I see a question in the chat room. Let me have a look. We see, and um, John, I know, is still trying to log on. Let me see what John is saying. Um, uh, sorry. Yes, so John is one of our guests. Um, let me just, uh, give me one second. Let me see if I can help him log on. He's been having trouble logging on. He's one of the adult child of parental alienation that we are trying to interview him today. Um, been having this technical problem. So give me one second, guys. Sorry. Um, what's going on? Let's see. Technology. All right, so. All right, so I email him. Let me have a look at your questions. I know you have questions in the chat room. Uh, while John is trying to log on, um, Okay, so we have Elena um, said hello, Albert said thank you. Stacy said this is psychological abuse. Yes, uh, parental alienation is definitely a form of psychological abuse. The child is being brainwashed. Um, the targeted parents are being brainwashed and also gaslight um, and gaslit and, and a lot of different things. And also not just the targeted parents and the alienated children, but also the public. Um, you know, school teachers are being brainwashed, the judges, the lawyers, the, the uh, child protective agencies, everybody, the neighbors, the friends, the family network, community. Um, it, it's a very serious form of psychological abuse. Um, it's shocking that um, the rest of the society is not recognizing this yet. And that's why we're working to try to push this. Um, okay, uh, Elena said, my daughter, gets more distant by week. And that's that's the problem with parental alienation, isn't it? Is that when you don't have the right interference, when you don't have the right intervention, um, then it will get very serious very quickly. Um, parental alienation needs intervention. And it's not the typical therapy. You need someone that truly understands parental alienation, someone that uh, knows what to do with it because the treatment for parental alienation is not a traditional form of therapy. Um, it is very different. The goal in um, parental alienation therapy is to um, reunite the relationship. Oh, I think we have John entering the room. Uh, Okay, I think John is getting online. Um, so give him a, a minute. So um, yeah, the the goal is to reunite the relationship between the child and the parent. But it's not just that because the child have been brainwashed. So you need to be able to re-educate the child, teach the child critical thinking so that the child recognize when the child is being brainwashed. And also you have to create that sense, um, there's that, power hierarchy that has been reversed in parental alienation where the child has been empowered to see that um, it's okay to disrespect the targeted parent, which is 
Definitely, that's that's the problem there because the child is sitting on the shoulders of the alienators to feel that they can uh, disrespect and treat you, you know, rudely. So. Uh, with parental alienation therapy or intervention, the therapists need to be able to revert that, um, invert that power dynamic. And then you also need to heal the damages that has been caused by alienation to the child, but also to the parent, because parents, targeted parents, a lot of the time are so hurt and so broken. So they are not fully open and willing and knows how to deal with this child that has been traumatized um, and then you also need education for the, the alienators and you need the right kind of enforcement to prevent further alienation from happening in place so you know when it comes to intervention of um, parental alienation it's pretty complex you can't just you throw the child into a traditional model of uh, therapy in order to fix this problem um stacy hi thank you so much um uh, Cynthia said parental alienation is child and spousal abuse. Yes, very, very true. John, can you hear me and can, um, and I don't see you in the video. Can you join my video too? And can you hear us? Um, Elena, thank you. Uh, Nayali said, where can I find the documentary? Um, so for people that are um, our supporter on Patreon, so we are on Patreon um, that, um, is under the name Victim to Hero. Um, and so for those that are a supporter of, um, on our Patreon, we're gonna do a screening, a private Zoom screening followed by Q&A for the supporters um, uh, of the film. And then the film is in the festival circuit. So we're gonna be in the festival circuit for a while first before we're gonna release that to the public. So we'll let you guys know. Elena said, uh, you give me hope, thank you. Uh, Okay, looks like John is trying to get on video. Um, hi, John. I can't hear Hello. you. How about now? Okay, good, 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 good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much for joining. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, uh, okay, so my name is Petra Dita from Victim to Hero Institute. This is our monthly event and I apologize that the other guest um, is not able to join today. And then John, um, thank you so much for joining. So today event is about interviewing the adult children of parental alienation about their experience in their childhood being alienated from one of their parents. So John, um, you were an alienated child, right? Who were you alienated from? Uh, my father. Okay. Um, um, is there any possibility for you to uh, be in one spot because I think the audio is sort of cutting in and out maybe yes yes ma'am take your time take your time okay, okay. Uh, okay Elena said Petra I'm learning how to approach my daughter with certain things and I hope for a positive outcome but it's exhausting and my heart is breaking um I I truly I truly empathize with that and I truly understand how you feel as targeted parents. It's very painful and it's very exhausting. And um, I'm glad that you are looking at learning to approach your daughter um, in, in a positive manner. And that's very important because a lot of targeted parents will react to the child's behavior. Um, and this is kind of like shooting the messenger instead of you know, um, because the child is a victim, really. So you cannot shoot the messenger. So anyway, I'm glad that that's what you're doing. Okay, John, um, thank you so much. So, okay, let's see if we can hear you a little bit better. And audience, let me know if you can hear John, um, because we wanna make sure that you well, you can hear him. Uh, so John, go ahead. Um, you said you were alienated from? My father, my dad. Oh, okay. How old were you at the time? Um, to be honest, it was almost lifelong. Uh, I don't have any real memory of my parents ever cohabitating. Um, they were married, but uh, it pretty much started when I was an infant. So as far as you and, and you guys in the chat room, can you actually hear John? OK, um, so John is saying that um, this happened okay stacy said she can hear john so that's good all right so this happened since he was an infant so you really never have any memories of your parents 
living together. Uh, did you have your father in your life at all? Uh, yes, ma'am. Give me one second. I'm really sorry. No worries. Take your time. Okay. Um, all right. So I think people can hear John. Okay. So I'm glad. All right. Um, I'm going to continue with the question while John settled down. Um, Cynthia said it's convenient for institutions such as courts and schools to pretend alienation doesn't exist because employees from these institutions don't want to take extra time to work uh, from work to deal with parental alienation. Cynthia, um, yeah, I totally agree. It's um, it's this. It's, unfortunately, this is a problem that um, that is top down. Actually, is that as a system, we don't recognize parental alienation. And when you don't recognize parental alienation as a problem, when you don't recognize something as a as a problem from the top down, then obviously, uh, if, if it's if it's not a problem, it doesn't exist. Then there's no resources, there's no education, there's no awareness, there's nothing. And and so it's it's courts, it's the school system, it's child protective agency, it's everybody. Um, and so that has to be changed. And that's that's unfortunately uh, why we are up against such a big battle is because um, when I started this work, I thought I just wanted to work with targeted parents. I wanted to, you know, bring information um, and knowledge to help you guys. But then very quickly, I realized that this is a very systematic problem. And if we don't fix the problem, the system, if we don't fix the system, then the problem, it's, it's almost impossible for you as parents. There's very little it can do because you are, your hands are tied. You cannot fight this. So that's why we started to put more effort on the system side of thing and trying to change the law. And that's that's why, because until we this is get recognized as a problem, um, you know, if it's not a problem, then obviously there's no need for resources. Um, but if we can get it recognized that this is child abuse and this is domestic violence, then then we can demand, you know, for you know, solution. We can demand for the alienators to be held accountable. We can demand for for help and support for victims. We can, you know, all sort of things. So that's why, you know, this unfortunately is a top down thing. So it's not just the employees that to be blamed. It's actually the system itself that's not providing the education, the resources for the employees at the school or, or at the court or wherever in order for this to be fixed. Okay, John. Um, all right, thank you. So you're settled now. You're good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Sorry okay, thank that. you. Okay, so um, you were saying that you did have your father in your life. So, like, what was it like? Do you, do you get to see him a few times a week, or how did that work? Uh, no, the part of the initial alienation was my mother moved across the state of Texas, um, so I was 500 miles away, and um. I was lucky that my father had the financial ability to go to court. And so he was able to get a pretty good deal at the time. I mean, and so I, and he had, again, the resources to pay to fly me there once a month. So um, that was, uh, that was from the time, like I said, I was probably two years old. <laughs> so your mother, after your parents separated, move across the state very far yes. from your father yes, and then from two years old once a month you flew to see your father yes ma'am how long do you see your father for um it would be a weekend um every month and then six weeks in the summer i see so one weekend a month and six weeks in the summer yes, um what was it like being with your father during that short times um, you know, I can remember um, bits and pieces of being really young and just, you know, I knew it was conflict. Um, and then as I got older and I would fly by myself, it was, uh, you know, it was just kind of, uh, you went there and then almost immediately you started dreading having to leave. You know, you dreaded having to go and then you dreaded ha having to go back. and. Um, my father was just kind of trying to, it was just like a fun weekend, you know, he didn't really have time to parent so much. 
So your father is what they would call the Disneyland parent. Yes, uh, ma'am. Right, where that's all the time they could have is to just kind of do something fun and that's it. Like not really in your life. Truly, your father is a visitor. So um, you said you feel like as soon as you turn up, you dread it going back. Why is that? Well, it was just, um, I love both my parents and I didn't want to leave any of them. Um, so, and then when you live one place, most of the time, you know, it's, there's always, there's something going on or, you know, you're going to miss something or, you know, I had to miss football games or things like that growing up to go see my dad. So, and, um, being there was airplane tickets involved, it wasn't flexible. So it just became a constant issue. I see. And then you said that you could tell that there was conflict. How could you tell that there was conflict? Um, you know, just both parents would kind of mention things, um, uh, you know, negative about the other. And then um, my mother had three children with her first husband, uh, my half siblings, and they also contributed to uh, denigrating my father when I was growing up. And, you know, I tell people a lot, I didn't understand why the people that I love didn't love my dad. I see. And then you said that um, they denigrated your dad. Like, what kind of things would talk about your dad? Oh, you know, they would just tell me how mean he was and how awful he was to them. And he was, uh, you know, he was a wealthy man, but he didn't care about me. He'd never come see me. I always had to see him. and He didn't treat my mom right. And, uh, just things like that. I see. And what was he like with you? How did he treat you? Um, most of the time he was uh, very loving and caring, uh, especially when I was young. Um, he had a bad temper and he was an abused child. So, um, there were some times where it was pretty rough going for both of us. Um, and I had another stepsister, half sister, that was his daughter. And her mother had been killed not too long before he married my mom. So it was just a, a big time ball of stress and emotions. And, um, you know, I, and then when I got older, um, it would turn into, uh, he would tell me things about my other, my brothers and sisters and things like that to try to, I guess, not make me follow their, I guess, you know, think everything they told me was the truth or something like that. But it ended up just being both sides firing back and forth at each other, and trying to justify what they did, but really just telling me hurtful things about people that I loved, you know? So really, you were caught in the middle of this battle when yes, both sides were fighting, and really, there's nothing to gain. Nice no, for neither of them. It's their right. egos. Yes, ma'am. It's just their ego because there's nothing to gain. I mean, you're you're a person on your own, and you're being moved back and forth with these trips. It's already set. Yes, ma'am. Did they go back to court that you know of? Did anyone trying to do more? No, ma'am. They never did. Um, they actually really they, were, they communicated um, decently, surprisingly, up until uh, I was about twelve years. Well, I was twelve years old, and then uh, they didn't communicate about some things going on with my schooling and a visit, and. Uh, my father, like I heard you say earlier that a lot of times the targeted parents react to the kid, shoot the messenger. And uh, so my father didn't speak to me for a couple of years to any of us. So that was really when it got severe. So from about 12, you didn't see your father for a while because he reacted. Yes, ma'am. And I didn't see him again until I was probably 15. So for three years, because he was not told about some kind of school function or school events or something. Well, I came home early from his house uh, in a summer break for a school event. And then it ended up not being 
when I came back, I had another week. So he felt that we had conspired or, or my mom had conspired to steal a week from him. And then, like I say, my mom never encouraged the relationship or said, you know, you guys, anything like that. It was just okay that I didn't speak to my dad. So at 15, you finally saw your father again, right? Yes. How, how or why? Um, I don't really remember, <laughs> to be honest, how we reconciled. Um, I, uh, again, my mom would send him pictures and things like that. So she didn't completely uh, ignore him. Um, but I don't really remember specifically, but I just remember going, starting to go back because I had a lot of memories in the town where he grew up and friends. And so I just remember around 15, finally going back and reintegrating into that city and my group social circles there. So from 15, um, and then how, how did your relationship with your father go? It was always this, uh, the repeating cycle. Um, we would be good and then something would happen. He would, uh, he would get, he would react. And by this time I was starting to show my emotional scars and then I would react and reject him. And, um, and then I actually ended up moving to live with him for a year. And uh, that was really good. And it was good for me. And then my mom. Sorry, how old were you then? 17 16 and 17 and after the year that I spent with my dad my junior year in high school my mother moved out of the state to Colorado and I moved with her and went to three high schools in three years so how was your relationship with your father during the the high school years when I was in Texas, it was good. When I moved away from Colorado, he didn't speak to me again for three years. Oh my God. And then, and then what happened? I was in the military and 9-11 uh, happened. And so uh, my dad was an army vet. And so I kind of, you know, that kind of just buried everything and we and then again you know I say it was just a roller coaster it'd be a good five years and then something would happen and then he'd be upset and then he passed away and it was in one of those cycles where he was upset you know and then, so yeah it was my entire relationship with my father was just a roller coaster from start to finish your father passed away um so like seven or so years ago Yes, ma'am. 2016. Yeah. And then so how, how did he pass away? Uh, he had a, a heart attack and then he needed a replacement valve surgery and they botched the surgery. So and then he never recovered from that. I'm sorry. W were you with him at the end of his life? Um, no, ma'am, I wasn't. I was uh, unable to travel at the time. We were in communication. We were speaking, so, but I didn't see him. I saw him about eight months before he passed, and that was the end. But at least you were in a somewhat a good term. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So, and I mean, I see in the chat room people saying, "Wow, John, they're sending you big hugs." Um, so. So that's a relationship between you and your father. Let's talk about the relationship between you and your mother. What, yes, what was it like? Um, I was, uh, all of my brothers and sisters, my half brothers and sisters were so much older than me. So I was almost an only child. I was basically an only child. They weren't in the home when I was growing up. And so my mother remarried to an over the road truck driver. So it was, basically a single mother scenario and uh, she raised me pretty much by herself you know the, my stepfather didn't have much input and uh, she I guess to put it blunt she spoiled me but I wasn't a priority if that makes any sense uh, she kind of just gave me things and uh, I was an athlete and so that was 
good. I got attention. <laughs> so that was kind of, I guess, our social deal is if I just got, if I perform, if I did right, got good grades and did good in sports, then I was a spoiled kid, you know, so not much discipline. So um, she was okay financially by the sound of it. She was well off. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so both your parents were, were well off. Yes, ma'am. So you said she spoiled you, but you weren't her priority. Right. Um, I guess, uh, she. I mean, she took great care of me, but like I see now that I'm older, that it was almost like a bribe. Um, she would buy me things, but if I needed someone to advocate for me in other places like that, there wasn't, you know, nothing anything like that emotionally um she was pretty distant uh, what what kind of things did you need advocate for oh you know just like i'd see other like uh if i was getting a rough time in school or anything like that um uh, having trouble with uh, a coach or a class or a teacher i was uh I was never, I wasn't diagnosed until I was in my 30s with uh, ADD and I started struggling at, in the eighth grade and uh, everybody just kind of, well, not everybody, the, the programs kind of wrote me off as being just not trying and uh, they, you know, nobody, she didn't, she wouldn't go and say, you know, there's something going on, you got good grades, what's happening, you know, it was just like, she kind of bought into the same thing. It's just, he doesn't want to try. He's not, you know, he doesn't care anymore and things like that. So and like so I said, you... I have a good relationship with my mother, so <laughs> it's not a, but this is just honesty, you know? So, um, so were you able, you felt like you were not, able to talk to her right and like i i I was the only athlete i guess best i put it i felt kind of like i was like a show pony you felt like you were a show pony yes ma'am so uh were you what did you have the impression that she was kind of taking pride in like look at me i'm the single mother and how good my child is performing I don't think it had really anything to do with the single mother aspect of it. I just think that the 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 positive attention. Um, we grew. I grew up in a really sports centric part of Texas, you know, so uh, that's a big social thing for the parents and things like that. So, and my father was the same way. I mean, I'm not just gonna throw that on my mom, you know. If if I was winning or getting a certificate or good grades or anything, then I was a good kid. But and when I struggled, it was just that I didn't care. Or I was lazy or any of those things. And uh, yeah, I didn't feel like I could really emotionally open up to people um, about weakness or struggles, you know? So when you had problem, nobody was there for you? Um, I guess they were, they were there, but it was kind of just topical. Um, if I would say, um, I was having trouble in math or if I would say that I was, I didn't want to go to school, you know, it was just kind of like, well, you know, you'll get better or, uh, you know, next year you'll have a different teacher and things like that, you know, and, uh, so, I mean, like they would listen, but there wasn't much activism. It was, like I said, I, feel un I felt unheard most of my life whenever it, things weren't going well for me. So um, you said that your mother was talking bad about your father saying that he, like what kind of things did she say about him? Oh, you know, she would just tell me how mean he was and um, he was very frugal. Uh, he was cheap but he said he was frugal but you know they would always kind of make me feel like if he wouldn't be that way I could be um, you know they would tell me my dad was rich and he didn't give me anything you know he didn't come and see me he only paid a little bit of child support and he made all this money just uh, things like that and he was I mean just uh, 
and they bad mouth him, you know, his temper. Uh, what Dr. Miller says, the fundamental flaw, you know, they, they convinced me that he was dangerous and angry person because they, he was angry with them sometimes. So you, how did you feel? Like, did you believe them? No, no, I never did. My dad was a really ahead of his time as far as fatherhood. You know, he, he had no problem sharing his emotions and telling me how he felt and things like that. So, no, I never really believed it. It was confusing. It was confusing. Yeah. So, really, it's none of your business as a child to hear about child support payment. Yes, ma'am. Right? And then yes, yet they put you in the middle of this. This is their business. This is adult business. You know, yes, why, why do you have to hear about money? And... Yet they put you in the middle of this and their conflict with each other. And yet you have to hear about it. Um, yes, this is a problem where parents is putting the burden on the child. I mean, like adults are not being responsible and then they have conflict with each other and then they put the child in the middle. It's terrible. And then so in your case, it, it's actually pretty nice, as in you still have contact with your fathers. So you are still being able to see that your father is a good guy. So at least you didn't buy into this, but you still felt confused and you felt conflicted because you go there and you feel like, oh, dreading going back. And you know, you never get to be there and just, just enjoy it, right? Yes, ma'am. It's robbed you of that full experience of being with one of your parents you, right. you're conflicted the whole time um so your mother actually you have a pretty good case because your mother also did not abuse you she seemed to be okay pretty well taking care of you yes ma'am uh, yeah and the system in a way um uh, was kind of unfair because they allow your mother to move away and you barely got to see him yes and ma'am. yeah so um, so, okay, so then you said the few years from 12 to 15, you didn't see him for three years. And then again, in high school, you didn't see him again for three years. Uh, no, I said, I, uh, my, so ninth and 10th grade, I, I saw him when time would allow. And then, uh, but wasn't very much. Then I moved to live with him as a junior. And then after my junior year, is when I left the state, and that's when he, he we quit speaking again until I was, uh, well, I guess I was 20, not 21, almost 21. When you were in the army? I was in the, sir, I was in the Coast Guard in Alaska. Yes, ma'am. I see. So, um, so your case is, is kind of interesting. Um, did you ever, um, did you ever react to your dad or your mom because of something that's said about them? Like, for example, like your siblings and your mother said, oh, your dad is bad. Does it ever cause you to be rude to your dad or, you know, repeating what they say to him? Um, no, not really. Uh, I never really had a disrespectful word really to say to my father. We. <laughs> We said me, uh, we were angry at each other, but being our personalities were uh, the same. He was kind of domineering and I was really young. So um, I didn't talk back to my, my, I didn't talk back to either of my parents, to be honest. Uh, my mother and I, when I was later in life, uh, have had some disrespectful conversations about this situation. What, what kind of things? Oh, you know, just uh, like when I started learning about Prince alienation and the symptoms and things like that, and I would bring it up and then I she would go cold and then uh, she would kind of, if I said something and kind of tried to get her to say something back to me, she would kind of throw it back in my face or spin it or um, like I say, you know, it was, it's hard to, to say about your mother, especially when you love her, but you know, she's a, uh, we have a narcissistic tendency in my whole family. And so uh, that's been like, I've learned that I just have to let it go with her. Um, it's not going to be something we can talk 
through and come to a realization. So you try to confront her and she refused to engage in that conversation? Yes. How did you find out about parental alienation? I'm going through it with my own children. So that's how you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. How did you recognize it when you were going through with your children? How did you figure out the term parental alienation, for example? Um, I guess you'd call it faith, or I mean, fate, grace of God or whatever. I was in a horrible place mentally and uh, I was just searching for answers wherever I could find them. And uh, I just Google, YouTube searched, how can you, uh, or what are, what are signs of parental alienation or something just like that. And I found Dr. Stephen Miller. And from the second he started talking, I was like, wow, that's spot on exactly what I'm going through. And then like, I went back and started thinking of all this, like how it applied to my childhood as well. Um, for parents that haven't seen the interview that we did with Dr. Steve Miller, please check it out on our uh, Facebook page in the videos tab. Um, it's it's amazing. We did this, I think, three hours uh, interview with Dr. Miller, and he really breaks this down to really, really deep um, and very scientifically. Um, so that's one of the things that we strive for um, in our platform. Uh, I think we lost John somewhere. Okay, hi. Um, so is that we're trying to uh, have less opinions and trying to be more scientific. So we make sure that we do our vetting and we try to bring information that has been you know, uh, peer review in scientific publications, and we bring experts that have been vetted through successful case in, you know, both the state and the federal level, and as well as looking at, you know, like I said, peer review information before we bring on a guest. So anyway, so if you haven't seen that, uh, please check that out. So, so John, I wanted to, I, I wonder what, now that you look back, what do you think how has this impacted you as a child back then? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? My audio went down for a second. It's okay. Um, I, I wonder what was it like? Like, how did it impact you as a child? Um, you know, it was, uh, I, I kind of had to make up my dad to other people, to the, you know, the, my peer group and things like that, because, they never met him, you know, out of my entire life, I think probably three or four of my friends that weren't from where he was from ever met my father. And so I kind of had to invent that in my mind. And so, or not invent it in my mind, but I just had to kind of paint that picture for everyone else. And um, it kind of made me look um, like an exaggerator because I made this, I told everybody these stories about my dad and, you know, the things, but he never was around and things like that. Um, and then, uh, so then it kind of turned me into, like I say, we have a narcissistic tendency in my family. And so that's when it kind of started coming out. I didn't get a lot of the attention that I thought I would have got if my dad was around. And so I kind of started to seek it in other ways, you know, and I was, uh, I was always the daredevil kind of kid, the kid that would take a chance, uh, you know, whatever would get me friends, quote unquote, or attention or popular, or whatever I was craving, you know, and, uh, and then it just kind of, luckily I was able to find a place in sports that kind of filled that hole. Um, so I would say that my probably my most of my childhood, my, the biggest effect it had on me is that I was always trying to find approval and it turned me into, I'm really hard on myself even now. So um, that was interesting what you said about you, you have to invent your father. So Clearly, what it did is that you felt like um, if you were being honest about your situation, you would be seen as an odd one out. So you don't want to be seen as odd yes, one out. Yes, ma'am. Right. So then you wanted to be like a normal kid with other kids. Yes. 
so you have to pretend like you have your father in your life and so you invented yes, this father um what kind of father figure did you invent like was he a good guy was he amazing was he terrible like what, what kind of things and what kind of stories did you tell well that's the thing you know it's it would kind of I, since nobody would ever meet him i could kind of adjust it you know and i kind of got into the you know whatever i needed to whatever i needed him to be at the time he could be you know so um but like i said it was from i did believe it you know my dad was a very accomplished man and he uh he was he didn't need me to embellish anything for him but because he wasn't there I uh, felt, I guess I kind of felt like everybody else probably didn't think well of him, think good things about him. So I tried to prop him up when uh, people talk about their dad, I talk about my dad and I could embellish it if I needed to, to try to, I guess, be a one upper kind of whatever you want to call it. Right. So he, he was already a great guy and you know that, yes, but you don't have the specific stories. So you right. you came up with these particular interaction or stories or events to fill in whatever the situation that you were in at the time. Yes, ma'am. That's interesting. And then the other thing that you talk about is that because you did not have this foundation of having both of your parents in your life properly, you seek attention elsewhere. Yep. And luckily for your case, that attention came from sport, which is healthy. For other adult children of parental alienation, when they look back, um, the attention come from a lot of the time, really bad places. You know, they end up in gangs, they end up in inappropriate relationships. We have a lot of adult children of parental alienation that when that you look back, they got involved with, you know, people that way older than them that they were child and end up in relationship with, you know, really old people, and that's really inappropriate. Um, things like that, um, you know, um, alcohol dependency, drugs dependency, you know, attention comes from a lot of places. So for your case, at least you got the attention from sport, which is healthy. And that's the thing too, is sometimes alienators will argue that, hey, look at the child, the child is good because the child is performing well at school or the child is performing well in sport and, you know, extra curriculums. Well, that has nothing to do with the fact that the child is still an alienated child and severely psychologically damaged. This man, your... 100%. Right. So you talk about how you felt as a child. What do you think is a long term impact on you? Well, I had, uh, I actually, I mean, I did do, I performed in sports, but I was, uh, I started drinking way too early. Uh, I got involved with drugs, um, even as a teenager. So, uh, then I went to the service, went to, and, uh, got out of the service, all of that. And, uh, it's just kind of always left me, um, I guess I don't ever feel like I'm going to be good enough. Uh, I'm never going to make the the marks that I should make. I tell people, you know, I had so many advantages. Uh, you're I don't want to be a motivated up. guy. Uh, I could, you know, but oh, John, John, better now. Uh -oh. Yeah, I think it was breaking up, so I missed the last, like, few minutes do you want to uh -oh. try to repeat that yeah um oh i was just saying that i just uh i fell into the alcohol and drugs and stuff like that as well and uh, i just was again i was able to just stay out of it because i was kind of it was kind of a thrill to me and to kind of be a bad kid uh you know living on the edge things like that and then it kind of carried over the risky behaviors, things like that never really went away um, until I got much older, like into my 30s. So and had kids and things like that. So that would be a huge impact. And then I have a very hard time with conflict. 
Um, so, and I guess in my mind, a lot. If I'm not in a good mind space, there's only two conflict resolution processes. It's either anger and yelling, or not talking and just quit speaking to people. Yeah. So um, I saw a few things there. Uh, one is that it, um, you, um, because of parental alienation, you lack of this security in your, um, I guess, self-esteem. So you're seeking attention in sport, and then you're also seeking sort of like a, a, a safe place by alcohol and drugs, right? Right, self-medication. Self, yeah, self-medication through that. And then the other things that you also talk about is that you felt like you're never good enough um, so that's 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 something is that parental alienation does is really impact the children's sense of self esteem because you're constantly seeking your that's a problem right because the child is now being put in the middle of the conflict the child felt like their love from their parents are constantly at risk like as if you're not fully loved by either of the parents so you're like why am i not good enough so then you carry on this self-esteem issue for the rest of your life right and you said you don't feel like you're ever good enough even though like from what i can see like you said you did well in school you you did well in sport you were a vet so you did all these amazing things um and yet you consider yourself not good enough that's that's interesting I think yes, man. Uh, I come from a pretty successful family. <laughs> they put the bar pretty high. So that has something to do with it as well. But yes, I've always, again, you know, kind of the, back to the show pony thing. Um, if I perform, then I'm good. But if I'm not, like everybody thinks, if I'm not doing what everybody thinks I should do, I feel like they write me off or they judge me harshly. And um, if I'm not perfect every day. So you feel like um, their love for you is conditional. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have this unconditional love. And then the other things that I noticed is you also talk about how it impacts your interpersonal skill. So it, it translates into how you deal with your other relationship in life. You said you had problem with dealing with conflict because you felt like everything is like the ultimate thing. Like just, just a little conflict is like, oh, there's no way of resolving this. You don't have a way of constructively resolving conflict. Yes, ma'am. How how uh how has it impacted your other relationships in life other than just the conflict aspect? Um, yeah, I have trouble maintaining consistent relationships for sure. Um why is that? I just either like I said, I'm too judge I'm too harsh. I'm not patient with people or a lot of the times, I guess I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, I want to say preemptive, but if I feel like people aren't genuine or like there's a chance that they might, um, I guess like not be my friend anymore or leave me or hurt me, I just shut them out. I get rid of them, you know? So you're a lot more critical um, instead of putting effort into trying to build. And that's a problem, right? Because in reality, there's no perfect people. Um, exactly. And um, one of the big things about alienated children is the lack of ambivalence, is that we think black and white instead of this spectrum of gray. Um, so instead of trying to build relationships and recognize that people do make mistakes and people do need to change, we're very quick to be critical and we will cut people out. Um, and we're looking for perfections. We're critical of everything, of ourselves and of everyone else, right? Um, yes, ma'am. So then it makes it very difficult to build genuine and long-term relationships. Yes, ma'am. Right. And then also you feel like because your people's love for you is conditional, so you are performing instead of living your life genuinely and authentically yes ma'am so does that make you feel lonely oh it's uh i'm almost like 
that we always I'm I'm almost agoraphobic anymore. I don't like to go out. I don't really like to go and see things, people, anything. I just like to stay around my place just because it's kind of made me this, like you say, I'm tired of performing, I guess. So when do you, when you feel down, what do you do to cope? Like when you feel in pain, um, emotionally, who do you, who do you feel can get you? Who do you feel that would be there for you? I might have a couple of good friends, uh, and then uh i guess that's probably about it like i said i don't have a real big circle so i kind of just live i guess i you know i feel lonely and i'm kind of a loner you know do you feel like there's people that really understand you no not too many do you feel like you have a safe um a safe haven as in like no matter what someone is gonna have your back um i used to just to it's been it's been a rough year uh that person passed away so <laughs> that's a tough thing to talk about uh i buried my older brother yesterday so <laughs> yeah he's uh oh, it was no. rough that was the guy And then my mom is pretty good, but like I say, she has the distance, uh, that wall about, you know, when things get too emotional. I think it's like therapy. I go to therapy, (laughs) the VA, my therapist helps. Okay, you do get therapy, that's good, okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, one of the things um, that happened a lot with alienated children that I talked to is that this sense of um, lack of an emotional home because they don't get, they don't feel like they truly can count on their mother or their father. So they have this sense of emotional homelessness. Did you feel that when you were younger as a child? Um, not as much. Um... A little bit, you know, like, uh, again, like I said, I felt more like a show pony. So um, I guess it really was, the emotions weren't too much of an option at that time, um, other than, I guess, you know, outbursts. I've always had a bad temper. If you were going back, let's say if none of this was happening that your parents divorced let's just say that if you could go back and that your parents would divorce and you were going back and forth but both parents are nice they don't talk bad about each other how do you think your life would have been different um well like i i just i probably would have seen how respectful relationships uh uh-oh um again the conflict resolution to see how people um handle problems without blowing up the entire um relationship i can see that and um that was the you know like I, they were nice to each other for large chunks of time they could be nice to each other you know and, um they reconciled a couple of times when i was young you know they when my mom moved back and so that was a whole nother ball of wax uh but they were nice to each other for large amounts of time and so then again it was a confusion again because last year you guys wanted to maybe get back together and now we don't speak or now you guys hate each other again kind of thing do you believe in in love and relationship that can last a lifetime yeah i do um i've seen it um my grandpa loved my grandma (laughs) um and they were together a long time i don't know how she if she reciprocated but you know i i see certain people and certain couples that i believe are really truly in love and care about each other 
but I would say overwhelmingly most people are kind of in false or arrangement. You know, it's it's almost a business arrangement more than love a lot of the times, in my opinion. Do you think it's possible for you? Not anymore. Um, I, it's bad self humor, but you know, I've just I kind of tell people like, yeah, I'm not good at being in, in relationships. So, um, and anybody that I would care enough about to be in a relationship with them, I wouldn't want to treat them bad. Do you think that? So you mentioned that, um, and this is pretty common: is that parental alienation is a, is a multi, is an intergenerational thing. So when you were alienated as a child, it's very likely that you're gonna end up being the alienator or the targeted parent. Um, so in your case, you're now being a targeted parent. Yes, Do you ma'am. think that? If you were not alienated as a child, would you have got into a situation today that you're being a targeted parent? No. Um, I, uh, like I said, when I started therapy, I really started a lot of self-reflection. And I uh, always tended to pursue relationships with people that would kind of treat me the same way that my parents did, you know. Um, I've never really been in a long-term loving relationship. My longest was uh, five years, and that was turmoil for a lot of the time, and it ended badly, you know, things like that. So, yeah, it was, it's been rough. So you seek out relationship that was toxic because that's what you saw as childhood, you're familiar with it. Right. And I like to, I like to think that I can help people. You know, I I know what's wrong. I know why relationships don't work. So we can fix this or, you know, you're being treated bad. Somebody's being treated badly. I can help them. And then um, I don't have very good boundaries. So uh, I tend to let people that I care about kind of use me. You see yourself as a fixer. You see that Definitely. how they treat you is that you can you can be the savior that you could save right. them. Yeah. And I'm a coach. Uh, and that kind of feeds right into that, you know. Um, I feel like I can solve problems if you just let me work at it. So. Um, because you're an empath, so you, so you feel like. You you take on the problem yourself, and then you allow yes, people to abuse you. Yes, man. Instead of being shown what a good relationship is like and where to set boundaries, you. Right. I'm sorry. Um. Yeah. So this is um this is very common um in alienated children, uh. And a lot of us, um, a lot of us turn into the cynical beings that we lost faith in true love and relationship that could last a lifetime because all we see is brokenness. We never seen how it worked. And we lost faith in ourselves, in our ability to make it last yes ma'am yeah i'm gonna pick up some questions i know there's a lot of questions in the room and i apologize i haven't been checking so i'm gonna pick up questions um as many questions as i can and let's see if we could do that uh john how long do you have do you have to go soon can we stay for a bit more oh yeah we're good i i forgot okay. about it but i wasn't doing anything really important so. okay thank you so much uh albert um, said, thank you for sharing this, John. The mother of my daughter moved 200 miles away and kept me from my daughter until she was two and a half years old. Um, I see my daughter every weekend right now for six hours on Saturday and six hours on Sunday. What do you remember from three years old? 
Thank you for the detail. Um, like, that's when I can kind of remember really starting to know that the if the transition wasn't going to be good, you know, I can, that's when I kind of remember crying in the airport or, or um, things like, uh, that's when I can kind of remember uh, uh, if I said something around my dad about my stepdad that he could get defensive, things like that. So that's when I started really picking up the, um, the real kind of just uh, conflict and the, sort of the pettiness and the trying to hurt people and like I said you know I say it a lot I never uh, that's when I started wondering why the people I loved everybody and why they all didn't like each other it was just confusing um yeah so at three years old that's yeah that's so John started to notice these behaviors um as a child uh my father was removed from my life when I was really, really young, like way before three, from what I understand was like two or even before that. And I could remember a sense of uh, when I was like even younger than two, like I don't remember the actual um, activities, but I do remember a sense of love, like this glowing sense of the presence of my father before he was removed from my life. Um, so I was really young. And I do remember the sense of like being in my crib, you know, as a baby and, and there's that love going on. Um, so that's what I remember as a child. But I mean, I didn't have my father at all uh, for the rest of my life. Um, Michelle said before he left, he was working, pay for old food, formula, diapers, bought him clothes, toys, etc., and gave him, gave her cash every week from every paycheck. Hey, where'd he go? Hey. Oh, I'm back. Welcome <laughs> back. Okay. okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. I was, I'm just reading um, question, a question here from Michelle. Um, Oh, actually, I figured out a way of seeing questions now. I think is that is that how you see question? How do you see question? I I've always had this trouble of seeing questions. Uh, it kind of scroll past and then I kind of lose it. But okay, so Michelle said um, before he left. Michelle, who are we talking about here? I'm so sorry. I I don't understand the context of this comment. Um, wow. But anyway, so she said before he left, he was working, pay for all the food, formula, diapers, and brought him clothes, toys, etc., and gave her cash every week from every paycheck. Now this gel, oh, this garden at Lightum, and her mother are telling everyone in town that my son, oh, okay, Michelle is talking about her son, who is a targeted parent. Um, so her son never cared and never did anything for his child. And that's not true. And these people are telling uh, friends and family and they all know better. And that's the thing is that alienators will lie. They will right. create the story. And this is something that I, I question a lot. Like sometimes I'm going, do they really believe in their lie or they like, and sometimes it seems that they truly believed it. It's pretty shocking. They actually rewrite the history and believe in this fake story that they created, it seems. Yes, ma'am. Did I... you think that your mother forget that your father is a good guy? Uh, no, she, uh, when she wasn't angry with him, <laughs> uh, she just, uh, I don't think she forgot, but I just don't think that he necessarily gave in to everything all the time. And whenever he stood up for himself, then she would take into that same, you know, your dad didn't do this, your dad, you know, it was never your dad doesn't love you, but the little hints, things like that. And then, like I said, my brothers, my sisters, everybody kind of, I had a stepdad that, you know, they all kind of jumped on. And uh, 
Yeah. I think they call them flying monkeys in some of the PAs. Uh, everybody just kind of hammered down. And, you know, the thing that you said is spot on. All narcissists, they, make, they tell stories to try to get people on their side. So I've yeah. experienced that from both ends. You know, I'm currently the same way. I was, you know, and one thing that I can say about being on both ends is that I forgave my father for a lot too when I started to experience this. So now that you experience it, you're now finally in the shoes of your father, so you could actually empathize for what he went through and understand it, and you could finally forgive him. Yes, ma'am. Um, and that's the thing, this is the thing for targeted parents, why it's so challenging for you is that your children don't understand what you're going through. Your children may see that you love them. Their children may see that you're a good guy, but it's difficult for them to empathize with you because they don't experience it themselves until later in life if they did. Um, and so, and then obviously there's always this huge campaign of denigration, you know, mudsliding and mudslinging and, and all these stories are being told, not just to the child themselves, but to all the community around. And when the lines are being repeated over and over and over again, it's very powerful and it's very effective and it doesn't matter how, how outrageous that lie is, it's going to be bought in, it's going to be believed. And unfortunately, that's the situation. Um, uh, Elena said, life feels ho hopeless as far as re-establishing re a bond. Um, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, I, I don't want you to use the word hopeless for targeted parents. It's very important that you're holding on to that hope because if you start from that foundation where you feel like, and, and it's very easy to feel hopeless and helpless, um, the situation is very challenging. But if you start from a different foundation where you have this conviction that you are going to get your children back and that life's going to be amazing and you're going to get your children back whole and full and complete, um, then everything that you do is empowered. And so it's very important to have that mindset that you don't give up, that you don't have this sense of hopelessness. It's so important because reality is however things are. Your mindset is a separate thing. Your mindset has some impact on the reality because your mindset determines your actions. And then your mindset um, determine your behavior and your attitude. Your behavior, your attitude, your actions impacted other things around you, people and results of things. So if you start from the right mindset of having this empower conviction that you are going to win, you're going to get your children back, nothing can take away this love, then everything can change from there. And I know it feels very painful right now but you can get if you can get to the right mindset and so it's very important and even though it feels like oh is this is so detached and has nothing to do with everything it actually has everything to do with the rest of your your journey so don't um yeah i can't emphasize enough about that don't carry on this sense of hopelessness because it really uh impact you uh, Elena said, I'm sure I'm not alone uh, when I say how much I miss my daughter and my child. John, both adults fighting each other and child is forced to be the third wheel. The fighting has nothing to do with the child. It's about hurting the other adult or alienated parent. And it's about revenge. And yes, that, and that's that's the unfortunate thing. I think about this a lot um, where I realize that some of the alienators um, are, are, are actually simply um, they are so selfish and some of them are really, really malicious, but some of them are a little bit actually just simply lack of awareness. They are like a child. They just want to win and they don't realize the impact on the children. And the thing is, um, it's hard for someone to feel the pain that they cause someone else. Right. So, um, you know, even though in physics, like when you in when you uh, create a force and then there's a there would be a balance force in return right that's in physics but in reality is that if you let's say if i'm carrying a knife and i'm walking around and i don't care i'm just carrying this knife and if i happen to bump into someone and this knife cuts someone 
that person get hurt really painfully because the knife is sharp and it cut that person. But I don't feel that pain. It's impossible, impossible, even though that it's, you know, when you cut the person, the knife get pushed back to you, but you don't feel that pain. And that's the problem is the alienators, um, there's no form of feedback for them to feel that pain. So sometimes some alienators are very malicious, but some of them simply is ignorant. It's, it's just lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, and they don't understand the pain that they cause the children and the pain that they cause the targeted parents. Um, so sometimes they're just doing it, just out of selfishness. So I think there are alienators that you could potentially educate them to change the situation. And there are alienators that it takes a lot more than just education and, and awareness, unfortunately. So anyway, that's, um, that's just my thoughts on that. Um, and for sure, yes, targeted parents, it's, it's very painful. Okay, uh, Michelle said it's very sad that the child is a pawn in the middle of the fight. Um, Natoli said, I've been rebuilding with my daughter for the past 10 years and another son since the past four years and all of my kids were alienated from me from two different dads. Wow, that's really tough to be fighting uh, against multiple alienators. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, okay, Elena said, nothing I say or do reaches my daughter. I'm going to practice critical thinking towards her. Um, so when it comes to um, parental alienation, a lot of the time, unfortunately, um, like if you still have contact with your children and if you could still have time with your children, that's amazing. There's a lot, a lot, a lot you can do. Um, but when you don't have any contact whatsoever, then that's when you really need court intervention. Um, and you need, you know, you need a way to reach your children. But if you still have some, some form of contact with your children, then I fully highly recommend you to pick up skill set to communicate with your children because if you still have any kind of contact whatsoever there are a lot a lot you can do to turn the, the situation around um albert said um john thank you for sharing this i'm a marine vet myself and i'm grateful for you to share so that i can learn from your experiences thank you albert Lars said, thank you for sharing this. Was it gradually increased understanding or a penny drop moment for realizing the big picture with parental alienation for you? I think uh, John, okay, John just got dropped out. So we're gonna wait for John to get back. But I think John was saying that the reason he recognizes this is because he became a targeted parent himself. And when he was doing research for his own personal case is when he recognized that uh, what happened. And so let me see if John's back. Uh, okay, he's not back yet. But um, so I think, and, and we have seen this in a lot of cases is when the children became um, something happened in their life, and that became the moment of truth that they, they become aware. So for John's case, unfortunately, now that he realized that his father had passed, so he forgave his father, but um, unfortunately, there's no opportunity, opportunity now for him to rebuild that relationship fully. Um, and also for his father is that his father was a targeted parent, but his father reacted to things. Um, and his father also engaging in some parental alienation behaviors. So that's the problem is as a targeted parent, you have to be super careful. It's very natural for you to, to fight back. You want to fight back and you want to prove yourself and you want to to defend yourself. So it's natural for you to react and, and all that kind of things. but um if you are aware and if you are educated about parental alienation then you learn to not put your child in the middle and not engaging in also you know retaliation behaviors um evelyn has a question about how did you realize that the things one parent or relative said about the other parent were not true that's a very good question i'm going to ask when john come back i think he's trying to reconnecting back uh, but one of the things that he said in the interview is that he was still seeing his father and he could see that his father was very loving and his father was comfortable sharing his experience, uh, like his emotion with him. Um, so he could tell that his father was a good guy. Uh, Cynthia said, thank you, John and Petra for sharing this. Thank you. 
uh alina said i suggest uh participating um daniel said are his kids being alienated from him now i believe that the situation daniel um Elena said, it's hard to pick up the pieces. I don't know where to start. Uh, Elena, I will say that I I really think it's amazing that you're here in watching this because you are doing everything you can to get yourself, um, you, you pick up learning, you're trying to educate yourself. So that's the very big first important step is to educate yourself because like I said, it starts from your mindset. Once you can figure out and understand what's going on, then you can plan out the strategy, you can map out the strategy to fix your situation. Um, it's very hard to pick up the pieces, but it's possible to pick up the pieces. It's not impossible. Um, Mary from Hamilton in Canada. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Elena said that my daughter will be 15 and it only took half of a year to get her brainwashed. It kills me. Okay, 15 is pretty young. So I would definitely highly recommend that you don't give up yet because your child is very, very young. There's a whole life ahead of her. There's so much more that you can still rebuild with her. So don't give up. Um, it doesn't take long at all to get a child brainwashed. Really, it doesn't. Um, Um, Mary said, I've been alienated both from my dad and my children for over 16 years. Mary is one of the adult child of parental alienation. If you guys haven't seen that interview that we did of her, check out in our videos. I mean, we have this series of a lot of adult children that we have interviewed. Um, Cynthia said, I think alienators try to believe in their lives so they don't feel guilty from alienation, um, from alienating their children. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it's, it's so... Um, one of the things, um, I mean, before I started working on this, I, uh, I'm a filmmaker, right? So as a filmmaker, and especially when you write stories, um, you when you write a, a script, right, a story, there are good characters and there are bad characters. And one of the key things about writing bad characters is that you need to recognize that there's no just, you can't write a bad character that's just bad, right? The reason a bad character um, is bad is because a bad character feels justified. And so when you look at these bad characters in real life or in stories, is that they are damaged people themselves. They have been traumatized. They have been hurt through their childhood pain and trauma. So they, they themselves carry on this vengeance. They feel justified for their behavior. So they have reasons why they behave this way. Doesn't mean that they are right. Um, so when they doing these behaviors to their children, uh, alienating their children from you, they feel justified by something that going on between your relationship, you know, like, you know, your ex is alienating you because whatever's going on with your relationship and there's no perfect relationship. And also how the relationship goes is based on their interpretation of it, right? Because you could have been very nice to them, but for whatever the reason, they didn't feel loved or whatever. And so now they feel justified. So the same thing, they believe in these lines um, and, and it justifies their behavior. So for some targeted, for some alienators uh, in the Mao and um, in the Mao, cases, it's actually, it's actually possible to re-educate the alienators, to help them recognize and, you know, like to provide them with the empathy so that they can heal from their own pain, so that they can stop the alienating behaviors. Um, you know, you can educate them so that they recognize the damage and the trauma that they cause to the children and things like that. So it's possible uh, for the mild cases. But for the severe cases, you know, that's that's not possible. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Claudia said you need to be proactive. Absolutely. And if you guys haven't met Claudia, she's super proactive, like just an amazing advocate out there. She's not only proactive in her own case, but also in helping so many parents out there and advocating for law changes. Like really, she's, she's like, uh, She's like a bulldozer, seriously. Uh, and I say it in the nicest way, I've never seen anyone so proactive and so relentless 
in in fighting for this. Um, really, you guys should definitely reach out to her. Um, uh, Elena said, do I have to forgive my family for doing this to my daughter and I? Um, now, forgiveness is a completely different thing, and it's very important. Uh, do you have to? Have to is a, is a, is a strange term. Um, if you feel like you have to is 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 I don't think it's gonna work, but um, depends on the situation. Uh, and sometimes forgiveness is about you, um, because when you carry this pain and you don't forgive people, it's you that suffer, not them, right? So sometimes forgiveness is about giving yourself this uh, freedom, this relief from this pain. So yeah, it could help you, but I don't know your situation enough, so it's hard for me to to speak here because we don't get the whole context um okay so i don't see john coming back so i'm not sure what the situation is so i think we're gonna just stop um right here and then um i know that there's a there's a bunch of events that are coming up there's a lot that i wanted to bring but we wanted to uh, figure out a little bit more structured way of coming back with our events, but there's a lot that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I know that I wanted to talk about, I wanted to review some of um, the um, case laws um, relating to parental alienation. So um, that that was uh, published in a book called Family Law, uh, Science and Law. Uh, parental alienation, science and law, I apologize. Um, so I wanted to review the case law that was published in that book, and we're going to create that event soon. But um, there's something that I've been thinking of is I wanted to create a book club. Uh, not exactly book, not just book, but also scientific papers. So what I wanted to do is, and if you guys wanted to participate, uh, what I wanted to do is to create a group uh, where we would, um, you know, at maybe every two weeks, we would review and discuss one particular chapter of a book or maybe a particular paper or something like that uh, and discuss the learning from that. And then we would uh, share that Zoom call out to the public so people can get understanding because I think that there's a lot of knowledge out there, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of information out there that we need to connect that with targeted parents so that they can use this information for their personal cases. And so I think there's a gap between knowledge and uh, application and let's try to connect that. And um, I don't want it to be just me that doing it. So I think it would be better if we can have a, a kind of like a book club concept and it doesn't have to be consistent. You don't have to be participating every time, uh, you know, maybe for this two week you participate in reading this paper and then in the next two weeks it could be somebody else so um if you guys are interested let me know in the chat and then um i'll pick up a few people for the next um particular and, and i pick a particular chapter or a particular book or something like that and then um we'll share that information but it, and it would be a zoom call for this group and i'm thinking like maybe we can have five people per per two weeks and then um, this Zoom session is not going to be a time where you discuss about your personal case. I, I don't want to have it as a opinion, things like that. This is purely about reviewing a particular reading. Uh, and the purpose of this is to communicate the knowledge that's already out there by the scientific community or the legal community, and then help bringing that to the, the public. So if you guys are interested in participating for the next two weeks, you know, comment in the chat room and then um, and then I will pick up five people from the group and then we'll we'll start this. Um, so, yeah, so let me know uh, anyway. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Really appreciate you. Uh, if you could support us on Patreon, we would really appreciate that. If you can't, that's OK. Um, but if you wanted to support us on Patreon, we are victim to hero on Patreon or on if you don't want to uh, support, if we can't, if you can't support like as a monthly thing, uh, as a one time, you can support it through Venmo. We are on Venmo, also victim to hero and um, Join our mailing list on our website, victimtohero.com. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Please like, 
please comment, please share, um, because um, when you like and when you share, Facebook has its algorithm that help it pushing out to more people because we wanted the information to come out. Uh, I already see a number of people that say that they are um, they would like to join the book club. So thank you so much. Uh, and I will definitely go in and pick up five people for this book club concept.